Hi, and welcome along to Steve Wraith's True Crime Podcast. And two special guests today, I have Dr. David Lewis and Neil Jackson. Good afternoon, guys. Hello, good afternoon to you. Great to have you both on. And uh, we're here to discuss uh, a fantastic new book uh, that has been released over the last couple of weeks called Sibbit, A Body Under the Bridge, which is about a, a very infamous case in the Northeast. Um, many say that it was the inspiration behind the, the, the well-known film Get Carter. And uh, it's something which has become part of Northeast folklore. So, David, um, we'll come to you first because this book is, is not a new book. Um, it's a re-release of a book which was originally brought out in the 1960s. So please tell us a little bit about the original book. That's absolutely right. I, I would say about this book, it's, it's certainly not a new book because we dealt with this <laughs> all those years ago in the, in the early 70s. Uh, but it's a much more expanded book. I have had much more time to talk to people subsequently. And so, and I've also had many conversations, as had Neil, uh, with, with Michael, uh, less so with Dennis, although I originally came to be interested in the book through Dennis Stafford, well, at least through his parents, Joe Stafford, who was quite a character in his own right. I was working at that time as a, an investigative journalist in, based in Fleet Street, uh, which was then, of course, the, the hub of all newspapers. All the newspapers were lined up through Fleet Street. And my company, my agency I was working for, had an office just off Fleet Street, actually just abutting uh, Dr. Johnson's house, the famous Dr. Johnson. And so we, we were very interested in a whole range of things, mostly for the o European press. I wrote mainly for the Euro Europeans, the Americans and, and uh, people like that. And then we came across this story that Joe Stafford presented a petition or something to get his son released uh, from prison. And we later went down to see, uh, we went down to see Dennis uh, in Parkhurst on the Isle of Wight and then we went up to Wakefield to see Michael so the first time I met these guys they were they were doing their 12-year life sentence well, for a crime they certainly didn't commit uh, I'm not saying Dennis was the <laughs> purest of citizens but Michael I think was a confused young man who was led astray and tempted by the vast wealth which was being generated by social club services it must have been a very tempting lifestyle. He's very he's a very clever man, actually. He's a very good mathematician. And when he was in the RAF, for example, he had a very responsible job. He calculated the the the, the weight load of every aircraft and how it should be placed within the aircraft. And of course, had his maths led him astray, the aircraft would have crashed, and many people would have been killed. Uh, so I was sent by my editor to go and see Joe Stafford. And I remember meeting him and his wife in a rather small London flat they had and he told me all about the case and I thought there was something there to answer and at the time I had a good friend uh, who was a young lawyer a guy who unfortunately can't be here today he's very busy uh, but he was just starting his career as a London criminal lawyer boy, a guy called Peter Human and we drove up to Newcastle to uh, see what we could find out and I have to say our visit to Newcastle was memorable but probably in all the wrong ways uh, for example, we are followed. Rather surprising, the window of our hotel was the only window ever cleaned. And there was a guy there busy polishing the window hour after hour. And I can't help suspecting that maybe a microphone or two is playing. I have no evidence for that. It's just a suspicion I have. And certainly a suspicion the television crew who followed up on our book uh, had as well. Uh, we and they were followed. Our telephone calls were tapped. Nobody in, in the police at that time would speak with us. The local police were in, at South Het Kluwer, uh, slammed the door in our face. The miners were pretty cooperative, however, uh, particularly Tom Leake, the guy who had found Simmons' body, which we'll get onto in a minute. Uh, and he you know, welcomed us into his house, made us a strong brew of tea, I seem to remember, and actually lay on the sofa to show the position of Sibbert's body when he found it. So that was our first start. We wrote a book which was published by uh, Penguin Special, which was a, a very specialist book, but he got very widespread support from uh, those in power. Uh, I mean, we had a, a vast range of people across the entire political spectrum supporting our case, from Bertrand Russell, the famous philosopher at one end, uh, to a, a columnist for the Sunday Express, I think, 
who might, one might say was probably to the right of Hitler. Uh, but certainly they, they all came out of the school. They all thought that there was no case to answer for the two men and that they'd been, as we used to say, fitted up by the old Bill uh, who wanted somebody to blame for the murder. And they particularly wanted to put Dennis Stafford, who was a criminal who had humiliated them, both them personally, uh, through deals he was making up in Newcastle where he was working there, while he was on the run for, from prison, uh, while he was on the police most wanted list. And so they were very angry with him. And they in fact said to Michael Lavaglio, I understand, at one point in court when the trial was going on, if you say Dennis left you for a couple of hours or an hour or so, you can walk free now. But Michael, who actually believes the truth, uh, refused and so he went down with Dennis. So I think that that was our background to the events. Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating case and it's one, as I say, which yeah. uh, constantly makes the headlines decade after decade and, and some fascinating characters as well. Uh, just before I come to you, Neil, David, I just want to ask you, you know, what kind of what kind of person was, was Angus Sibbett? He was a victim in this case. And, um, you know, we don't seem, tend to hear a great deal about him, but what kind of person was he? Well, we've written quite a lot about him in the book, of course, and we've given a story which I quite like. It's how uh, Vince Lander, who was the boss, the founder of Social Club Services, and they were making so much money. I don't think we understand how much money they were making. I mean, he moved from a fairly small council house, which he had in Peterley, to Drydale Hall, which was a magnificent building, which still exists, of course, I believe. I think it was involved in a fire. It's been a rather unlucky building. Uh, but it was magnificent, huge grounds, farms, everything. So, you know, to move from a, a relatively modest background, I won't say entirely modest, he was making a lot of money in, Bry in, in right on the south coast before he was obliged, I would say, to move up to uh, Newcastle because of the pressures from L London Gagland uh, on him was fairly severe. And Michael tells a story of how on one occasion a very well-dressed man who looked like a solicitor's clerk arrived at his house uh, with a briefcase and a smart suit, pinstripe suit, and asked Michael if he was Michael Lavagli. And when Michael said yes, he produced a large pair of tailored scissors from the briefcase and cut his tie off just below the knot and said, next time it'll be your neck. So at that point, I think, uh, as I would have done, I'm sure you would have done as well, it was probably best to get out of town. Uh, Sibbert was an extraordinary character. He met up with Vince Lander when he came out of the army. He was 10 years in the army. He fought in Korea. He was, he was a very brave soldier. He was partly disabled because he'd had TB when he was a child and his left leg, I think it was his left leg, uh, anyhow, one of his legs was very thin as a result of the operations he'd had as a child. But he, he fought to get into the army. He'd always wanted to be a soldier. When he came out of the army, he became a fairly unsuccessful businessman running a Chinese restaurant, which went bust, I understand. He was also involved in, a, in, in some criminal activity, uh, which sent him behind bars for, for a couple of years. Uh, but when he made money, he made money. I mean, Vince Lander put a private detective on him to see, to find out whether he was spending the money he was taking from social club services on wine, women or song. And the detective said, it's all free. So he was a, a big spender. He was a very generous man. He would invite complete strangers to his table at the Dolce Vita and buy them food and wine and everything, you know, always. If he ran short of money, he would just nip out in, in his car for an hour or so, go to a fruit machines and collect the money he needed to pay for the meal. So he, he was an honest man, uh, but he was a big, big character. He was a man who, uh, you know, who really determined to make his way in the world, which he did from again a very humble start. Neil, um, you obviously became involved in this after reading this initial book and, and, and reading the book by David and by Peter. So you know, what made you get involved in this case? Well, yeah, I mean, that's right. I mean, I think, I think in fact, you were with me when I was handed the book, I think, Steve, um, first time. And, and I took the book, I'd never heard of it before. And I, and I mean, this would have been about 12 years ago, I guess. And, um, and I took the book and when I got home, I, I started the book and I, I, I genuinely couldn't put it down. I'm not just saying that because uh, David sat there at the bottom of my screen. But I, <laughs> I genuinely couldn't, couldn't put it down. And it, and it kind of left me feeling 
feeling uneasy. It left me feeling like some injustice had been done. I didn't know. I didn't know at that point whether Michael or Dennis were were guilty or innocent. But I certainly felt that the trial they'd received and the treatment they'd received had been had been unjust. They hadn't had a fair trial. I felt. Um, and one of those, these rare things that happens very very occasionally in life, and is that 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 kind of that feeling wouldn't let me go. That feeling niggled at me and you know it, it kept coming back and so I, I i felt i felt like i wanted to do something i know that sounds you know <laughs> a little bit hollywood but i just I, I genuinely felt that 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 something something had not been right here and and somebody needed to kind of stick their head up the parapet and highlight it and so initially i started um plans to to, to make a documentary film um about the case but very, very soon after we began that, um, it kind of became clear to me that that, that it was a, a much bigger, a much bigger thing than just a, a documentary film. Um, and so, I had a few um, a few dealings with Dennis. I've met Dennis a couple of times with with you, Steve. Um, so I, I met Dennis a couple of times. But Michael, Michael was always the the one who he, he was very reclusive. Nobody ever got to talk to Michael. Michael, Michael kept himself to himself. He didn't really. He didn't really court, court the publicity, um, and and so getting to Michael was a little bit more difficult. But I felt like I needed to talk to him, so it took probably probably a good three or four months before um, before I, I, I finally answered my phone. And it was and it was Michael Lavaglio, um, and we had a conversation that lasted probably about about an hour and a half, I would think, um, and. <laughs> I felt incredibly sorry for him afterwards. I have to say, I, I believed everything he said. Um, but he asked me during that first initial phone call um, if I would be prepared to look into the case, and um, but not to try and prove the fact that he was innocent, to look into the case and search for the truth. And if that meant, and in Michael's words, if that meant that I came out of it and said, you know, he was guilty, then so be it. Um, but he wanted me to go on a, on a search for the truth and that i think is is what i've tried to do i mean did you always feel after you'd got you know involved and you'd spoken to david and you'd spoken to peter you know that the guys were innocent me yes i i did go into it with an open mind i have to say i mean the the, the case and, and and david and peter's book you know highlighted some real shady goings on in terms of the trial and the run-up to the trial but I did go into it with an open mind but I mean it, probably the the thing that really nails it for me is that in order for it the whole murder to have worked it, it, it has a very narrow time time span um, it, when we were talking literally five minutes either way would have made it impossible for Michael or Dennis to have committed that crime and Michael and Dennis always said that they were together that night and the only time they left each other was when Dennis went outside to get some cigarettes from the car when they were in the birdcage club and he was gone for, you know, no more than five minutes. So if they were together all of that night, they couldn't possibly have, have been in, in South Hetton at the time the police were, police were saying. So that for me was the strongest indicator to begin with. But Michael, Michael was a very, a very emotional person. Um, he, he, and he, He's also a very, very moral person, um, and and as I got to know Michael, as I as I have done over the the last you know the last twelve years or so, um, I, I genuinely don't believe Michael would would have been capable of of a crime like that. I don't think he could have lived with himself. He, he genuinely couldn't. Um, Michael is is a lovely, generous, kind man who, as David. I said got caught up in the wrong crowd in the wrong scene and I think was was blinded by the glitz and the glamour of 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 you know the money the fast cars the you know the, the glamour and didn't genuinely know perhaps naively Mike Michael would probably would probably say the same thing naively didn't see what was going on around him until it was too late David coming back to you do you do you feel that the you know, the the two accused, Dennis Stafford and, and Michael Lavaglio, got a fair trial. 
No, absolutely not. I mean, I don't know. Nobody knows except them whether they killed Sibbett or not. I can't see why they should have done. I think he was a good friend of, particularly of Michael. I think he was best man at, at somebody's wedding. I think it was Michael's wedding. Mm. Uh, I, I really can't think that they would have any reason for killing him, no motive for killing him. Uh, and as Neil has said, no opportunity really. The only way you can perhaps conceivably claim this opportunity is if you say that they left the house at 11 o'clock, which everybody denies they ever said that. The only people who claim that are the police, are Superintendent Kell and his, his uh, sidekicks, who were determined, as I say, to put Davis behind behind the bars. I, I think one thing about uh, Sibbert, he was a man who created a lot of glamour because he was a, a friend, if only a drinking friend, of a great many celebrities of, of their time, people like Tom Jones. Uh, he set up a bar in his house, uh, which was a replica of, of a, a cocktail bar, and his friends would come and drink there. So he was a man who kind of put the glitter of, of show business around it. I think this attracted Michael as well. And I think he was, you know, pl proud and pleased to meet these people. He'd always looked on Vince, his brother, as, as a kind of god. I mean, in the book, we recount some of the stories which Michael told me, uh, how when he was a child, for example, they were evacuated, it was during the war, uh, out of the danger of London bombing. And uh, Vince was always looking for ways of making money, quick money. So, for example, he would send the boys, who were kind of his little gang, of 10, 11 year olds, whatever, out scrumping apples, because apples were a high price in, during the war years. And so he would then sell them on. He would pay the lads a few pence, I imagine, for stealing them or scrumping them. And then he would sell them at a good price. You know, he always had a good idea what it made a good price. He was always good at doing a good, a, a good deal. On another occasion, he made uh, poor little Michael dress up in very tatty clothes, little tatty shorts, a dirty shirt. And he rubbed his face in the mud and they got him to stand outside the, one of the big American Air Force bases, uh, begging the uh, GIs who were going off uh, on leave to uh, give him chocolates or whatever, cigarettes. And they were very generous. The Americans are very generous people. Uh, and they would give this poor little boy, they saw a little starving orphan boy, all these things, which, which uh, his brother Vince would simply take down the nearest shops and sell. So Vince was always a wheeler dealer. When Michael went to a very prestigious, won a scholarship to a very prestigious public school, which was part boys, boarders, and part day boys, uh, he found out from Michael that the boarders were not allowed to buy comics. So he set up another business with Michael. Michael would go out and buy the comics and then sell them at a markup um, to the boarders who were deprived of them. So Vince was always an excellent businessman. I don't think he was always a completely honest businessman. But he was always a very sharp businessman who just knew how to, you know, do a good deal. He was also very well in with the Newcastle hierarchy, particularly the police. There's one story which we were told, which I have no idea whether it's true or not, but it sounds true. On one occasion, he was driving one of his big posh cars uh, through Gateshead or somewhere in the in region. And there was nowhere to park. And he wanted to take his friend in for a meal. So he just left the car in the middle of the road, beckoned the copper over to him and said, look after my car while I'm away, will you? And the copper saluted and said, it'll be my pleasure, Mr. Lander. So you can see how, how well in he was with the police. Um, so I, I think he, I think we, we know at Newcastle in those days uh, was, had immensely corrupt council. T. Dan Smith, who everybody in the area will know of, uh, Paulson, the architect, uh, they were all in, you know, up, to, uh, up to their ears in, in, in corruption. Uh, and, and so I think the whole atmosphere, there was a, a milieu uh, in which criminals could, could thrive, provided they were big financial criminals and not kind of petty thieves like, uh, I suppose, Michael uh, Dennis Stafford had been originally. Same question to you, Neil. Do you think they got a fair trial? No, no, I, I think undoubtedly it didn't get a, they didn't get a fair trial. I think that there were, you know, a, a number of things in that. I mean, first of all, what a lot of people don't realise is that, that, that there was an immense kind of rush to justice almost yeah. at that time. If you, if you, if you, you, you think they were, they were arrested in the first week of January and they were standing before a court at trial less than three months later, um, 
that in you know in these days now where you know you'd, you'd be looking at a minimum of a year between arrest and trial you know three months is 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 totally you know unbelievable now um i think the, the fact the trial was held in newcastle i think where there have been a lot of unsavory news headlines and yeah. low the jurors you know have to try and put those things out of their minds, you know, they will have read those press, those press reports in, in, in the days leading up to it. They will have seen it in the, the days, you know, it would have been fresh in their minds as well from the arrest because it was only three months ago. So I don't think they, you know, I think nowadays you, the trial would have been moved to somewhere like Leeds or even London, but, but now, but, but then it was, it was held in Newcastle. Um, and I think as well, every, every juror, every juror was, was assigned a police officer and, that, that had been kind of unheard of in those, in those days. And I think, I mean, they did it with the craze a little bit later, um, but that really had been unheard of in, in those days. And, and the, the insinuation there is, is that, you know, the, the case that they're sitting in is a dangerous case. The men that they're trying, the men that they're having to make a decision about their guilt are, are dangerous because if they weren't dangerous, they wouldn't have got a, you know, a one-on-one -on -one bodyguard. So I think there are a number of things there to do with the trial that, that, that made it unfair but I think I, I think there was a huge amount to do with the evidence that was presented as well that made it unfair um, there was a, a number of statements were withheld from from the defense those so there were some some in the region about 164 statements um, withheld from from the defense in terms of the the, the mark 10 um, so the car that civil was found in um, when he was found, as you can see in the, the picture behind you <laughs> over your shoulder, um, that <laughs> the car was damaged um, and, and there was a body in the back. You know, there, there were a, a huge number of miners who gave statements and said that in the hours before the body was found, they'd seen the car, but there was no body in the back. There was no damage to the front of the car. They, they, they you know, they'd even kind of cleared the snow off and had a look in the window. Some of them had, you know, <laughs> had paid particular attention to it because yeah. South Hetton, for those who don't know it, is a, is, is a, is a, is a small mining town. Um, in those days, it was, a, it was a kind of almost like a 24 hour town because it had the pit and the, and the shifts worked in a kind of a 24 hour pattern. So, you know, the coal they were producing was such good quality that the pit operated 24 hours a day. So every hour of the day, there were people wandering past. Um, where in a, you know, any other town, people would have been in bed. People were walking past, going, going to the shift, coming back from their shift. Um, and, and a huge number of people spotted this vehicle and thought, well, that's a bit odd in South Hetton, a big fancy Jaguar. But nobody saw damage. Nobody saw a body in the back. And lots and lots of people studied it. But all of those statements were withheld from, from, from the defence at the time of trial. So they didn't even know that they existed. Things like um, fingerprint evidence. Um, there was... Um, for, there were fingerprints which we discovered later, but there were fingerprints taken um, in the in the Mark Ten, and the fingerprints that were, that were found were supposedly of good quality, and they didn't belong to the accused or or the victim. So they belonged to somebody different, but we don't know who because they weren't they weren't disclosed to the defence. And in fact, the defence didn't didn't find out about it until much many many years later when. Um, so David Napoli, the solicitor that that, um, that represented David, uh, David um, Michael at the appeal, um, discovered the police notebooks, and it was only then that he saw that that these these fingerprints had even been taken. So there, 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 there's a whole load of, of things that that perhaps misled the jury, if you want to say that. I think the I think the the, the tale of of, um, of the cyclist of, um, of of Golden, who gave one statement saying he was in one position, and then a couple of days later he was in, he was visited at home by a slightly more senior policeman, who um, then took a, a second statement that was that was different to the first, put him in a slightly different position, and the third statement again, making no mention of the previous two statements, came a couple of days later, a further even more senior policeman. He was taken to the to the, to the investigation headquarters at that point, an even more senior policeman interviews him, and he makes a third statement, making no no mention of the other two. So the only statement that the um, that the jury got to see or the defence knew existed was this third statement. But had they seen the first statement before the police had determined where the site of the murder had been, 
it would have put him cycling past the murder at exactly the point that the murder was happening. And so, of course, they had to change the statement. But the defence and the and, and the legal teams never got to, to know about those three statements until years later. No, I, I agree entirely, Neil. I think that Gold is one of the strongest cases against the murder uh, being taken place as, as it was claimed by the, by the prosecution. Mm. I mean, in our book, we publish, as you know, a diagram showing where Golden's position would have been at different speeds. I mean, there's yeah. no getting away from that. He would either have seen the lights of the car or he would have passed the murder as it was taking place. I mean, Kel, I think Kel was a single-minded copper. He got an idea in his head and then he went out of the way. In the book, we publish a, uh, a report of another murder he'd, interview, he'd looked at, a, I think the year or so before, where a woman had been found battered to death in the backyard of her house. Mm. And uh, okay. he was determined that this murder had been committed by somebody stealing coal from her backyard. And I, it took months and thousands of hours of police investigation before he finally came around to realising it was the husband what did it. And the husband was duly convicted uh, uh, for, for the murder. So I think once Kel got the idea in his head, that was all that mattered was proving the idea. I don't think he was interested in anything which disconfirmed the idea. Uh, I think he was uh, it, entirely determined that these two men had done it. And in those days, the 60s, and we had numerous interactions, I have to say, from a legal point of view with the police. Uh, and they, the, the police in those days were uh, enormously corrupt. I mean, particularly in London, the, the corruption was ridiculous. Thousands of pounds were being paid each week uh, by gag leaders and brothel keepers like Bernie Silver in the 70s and 80s. Thousands. One police officer was reputed to be getting £3,000 a week. I mean... <laughs> You know, every man has his price, I guess. But one thing I would say, I think, and I, my partner uh, comes, from the, for, comes from Newcastle, actually, uh, I think the people of Newcastle, by and large, are extraordinarily moral people. I think they have a strong idea of, what, of right and wrong. And I think one of the reasons perhaps the jury were influenced was because they, they believe these people led immoral lives. You know, they... they, they were determined to fleece the, the working man, who in those days wasn't paid very much, uh, for all he could, all they could take in any way, however marginally honest or dishonest it was. And I think they felt it was get-back time for people who'd spoiled their, uh, corrupted their society. These smart young men from the south, with their, you know, their their, their non geordie accent, who came in and sort of ruled the roost for a while, and I think they thought it was payback time. But just if I could just quickly deal, the, certainly the case was was very badly handled, and these days would have would have been laughed out of court. But the the uh, court of appeal, to which our first book got the two men back to the court of appeal, where unfortunately we were, it was under the, the uh, control of a man called Lord Chief Justice Widgery who uh, I think was, uh, well, I don't want to be rude, but I, I don't think he was entirely in his right mind when he held the trial. And he actually said, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, he said, because we produced 40 miners who are absolutely reputable men, you know, they wouldn't tell a lie. Uh, they, we produced 40 miners who claimed the car was, as you were saying, undamaged with nobody in the back, no damage to the front of the car, which was the key the crucial evidence which linked, linked the Mark 10 with the E-type. And he said, well, it's certainly very curious, he said, that these 40 miners should not have seen the car damaged, but we know it must have been because the police have told us so. So, you know, when you have that kind of judicial attitude, I, I think you're either hiding into nothing if you're innocent. Uh, we've, got about 10, we've got about 10 minutes left, Neil. So I, want to, I just want to ask how the police felt when you started asking questions about yeah. this case. Because obviously you became very embroiled in this. You, you felt there was an injustice. You, 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 mm. were, you, you were set on a mission now to uh, not only contact David and Peter, but also to, to try and clear uh, Dennis's name and, more importantly, Michael, who you, you built a good friendship up with. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think just... just I know, I'm conscious of the fact we've only got 10 minutes left, but just... just I would urge people to who, who get the book to read the, the, the chapter on the judge's summing up um, and also to, to, to look at how the judge um, in that summing up basically discounted every witness that kind of was 
was you know alibied Michael or Dennis's story. Um, I think it, it, the book deals with that in a in a really comprehensive way. But th those two other you know it's, it's well worth looking at those. Um, in terms of the police, um, I started off doing freedom of information requests, which is nowadays the only way you can get anything out of them. And sometimes it was it was um, a little bit hit and miss. Um, I got the new police and crime commissioner at the time, who was a, a chap called Ron Hogg, to uh, to take an interest. I met him two or three times, but um, and he he was very he was very. I mean, some of the things he said he said were you know he was very worried about the case. He was he was. Uh, he felt that there perhaps had been an, an injustice done. He wanted to do what he could to try and help resolve it. Um, and um, and I believed him, I took him at his word. And then literally the moment he appointed his first chief constable, uh, who was Mike Barton at the time, um, immediately cut all contact and didn't want anything to do with it at all. Now, whether that's linked or not, you can draw a conclusion yourselves. But what I will say is that Mike Barton personally took a decision then as chief constable to seal the file. So the, the murder file is still there in the, in the archives at, at, at Durham Constabulary. But Mike Barton personally, and I've got the email that shows it, personally chose to seal that file so that nobody could access it. Um, and that I found very strange. Yeah, very strange indeed. Um, David, for you, I mean, do you think we'll ever see the day that the, you know, the two of them are, are cleared of this murder, or do you think it's gone, you know, it's gone on too long now? There was obviously a an attempt to clear the names in in, in the High Court recently, but that that again, you know, fell you know fell flat and, and just fell at the final hurdle. Um, do you ever think, you know, Michael in particular will 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 get what he wants, which is his name cleared? No, I mean, Michael just put up a reward, what is it, 50,000 pounds or some huge sum? Yeah, 50,000, yeah. To clear his name. And I think that, I mean, he's not a rich man. And I think the, the fact you're prepared to sacrifice your life savings just to have your name cleared so you go to the grave uh, with, without a con you know, conviction for murder hanging over you, I think that just shows how genuine he is. And I, I, you know, I, I hope somebody will come forward and say, you know, because there are people out there, I'm perfectly convinced, still alive, Mm. And I can think of one or two names, which I won't mention, uh, who, who do know what happened. I'd have actually given uh, interviews with the, very often, very, uh, you know, very frank interviews with the police. Uh, well, well with, the, uh, with the investigative journalists, not with the, well, I don't know what they've said to the police. So I, I hope one of them will come forward, if, if not for the money, just because, you know, an injustice damages the whole of society. Just... Bad, obviously, bad, worse damage is Michael and Dennis, but we're all weakened. If we can't rely on the police, you know, in judicial circles, there's a saying that while the truth is fine, finality is even better. I don't think the state will ever reopen this case. I think they're embarrassed by it, and I think that they want to just hush it up, put it under the carpet, maybe perhaps appoint a commission to investigate it or report in 30 years' time when all of us are dead. There's some fascinating evidence, uh, fresh evidence in this book. I mean, you know, the, the police photograph showing the headlights being on when, according to the police, there should have been no battery left in the power, uh, you know, in the battery to power them. Um, you know, the, you're looking to, to Vince being a lot more involved than was originally thought. Tom Fellows and the new photo fit is in there. There's 3D crash analysis. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot in this book. I have been asked by people inquiring about the book. You know, what is new? Well, th there is a lot new in it. Um What's next for the case, Neil? And tell us a little bit about the documentary that you're making. Um, well, the documentary that I originally started out making is now is now being made. Um, we we look at the case, we look at the evidence, we speak to Michael, um, we 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 take it to bits really, um, and and it almost I guess full circle really in terms of the, the fact that you know, the, the journey started with, with the most unnatural book and, and, and here we are talking about this one. But I think my hope, and I think, I think David and Peter also, I think uh, my, my hope is that, is that the, the, the film, the documentary film, and, and this, 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 this fantastic book as well, will help catapult the, 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 the case back into the public eye. Um, and and there, there may be, a, you know, a clamor from the public to, to, to get some justice because, at this moment, all of the legal channels have been exhausted. So as David quite rightly says, unless somebody comes forward with fresh evidence, 
the, the legal channels are, got, are, are not open to us. Um, and so the documentary film, we're hoping will be, will be out certainly this year um and um and it's in the in the edit at the moment and we've, we've we've talked to all the key players but michael in particular it's michael's story more than anybody's um and and, and hopefully it will, will highlight what we what we feel is a is, is a massive injustice how is michael these days neil he's not great i mean he i'll be honest he's not been great for many years but health wise he he, he, he does suffer a little bit but he's still here and he's you know and he and he's still positive and he's still, you know, he rings me or I ring him and, he, you know, he, he's still incredibly positive and cheerful and, and chipper. Um, and bear in mind what, what, what's happened to him in his life. I think that's extraordinary. Um, he's a very thoughtful person, um, but his health isn't great. And, um, you know, he is in his 80s now. So time is of the essence. So, you know, if I, if I use this platform, I guess, to kind of encourage anybody who might have any information, to come forward while there's still time. We know what happened to Angus Sibbett. Obviously, we know Michael is still alive and 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 living in London. Uh, Dennis obviously lives in the northeast still. Both getting on now in 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 terms of age. Uh, what happened to Vince Lander, David? Well, Vince Lander spent 13 years ab- away from England in, in various parts, of Italy and places like that, uh, because he was afraid of being arrested. He was eventually arrested. Uh, but charged with a very minor crime uh, and uh, and released. And he went back into business, said he was going to be a millionaire again. He, I don't think he ever was. And his family left him uh, and he's ha- he had to sell his house, of course, when he went off to uh, live abroad. Uh, I think he died in a flat in south east, the east of England somewhere, all, all alone by, you know, when he died. I think he had a very tragic end, end to his life. I mean, I, I haven't spoken to him since uh, I was up in Newcastle in the 70s. I have to say, I think Lander's role was that he set off uh, an attempt to intimidate Sibbert, who I think he... As in we say in the book, there were two good reasons. One being the fact he was taking money from him. Well, it seems like he was taking some money from him at least. And there's another reason which we give in the book. And I just think he wanted to be taught a lesson. I just think it was a uh, a desire to threaten Sibbert, which went badly, badly wrong. And of course, from Michael and Dennis's point of view, cor- catastrophically badly wrong, because they ended up paying a price for crying. I don't think they could have committed. The book's available from www.badboysbooks.net. David, Neil, thanks very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.